Uh, okay, uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, this is the Dharma Doors. You're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective Zooming classroom. As usual, I'm MC Owens, uh, here to crack open another sutra, a new sutra tonight. Uh, this is going to be a fun experience for everybody um, because it's a new sutra to me. I've read it, but I've never taught it. Um, and you may have never heard of it. And so the sutra that we're going to be doing is this Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra. That might be its Sanskrit title, the Sanskrit title, the original, if we're, if we're interested in such things as that. The original Sanskrit title may have been the Akshyamati Padipricha Sutra, the questions of Akshyamati. Uh, this is Akshyamati here, whose name means inexhaustible mind or inexhaustible intellect. Um, I probably will have a few more things to say about that in a second, but this is our, our star bodhisattva tonight. I kind of made him with a, a kind of an egghead. He's kind of an egghead. He's, you know, inexhaustible intellect, you know. Um, so this is his sutra. And I've mentioned this before, or at least let me begin. This is sutra number 45. It's sutra number 45 of the heap of jewels. And at this point in the Dharma doors, all we're doing is, is kind of rolling around in the heap of jewels. Like that's kind of all we're doing. And so tonight we're gonna roll around in the 45th jewel in the pile. And that's this uh, uh, sutra of the questions of Bodhisattva Akshyamati, whose name means inexhaustible intellect. But what's interesting about Akshayamati is that we've encountered him before, or at least in the Dharma doors, we've encountered him before. Um, this is an interesting bodhisattva. I am sort of, um, I'm on the on the hunt. I'm trying to figure out who is this who is this bodhisattva. Well, we we encountered him once before in the Vimalakirti Nirdesha Sutra, the, the, the advice of the layman Vimalakirti. And actually in the very, very famous uh, entering the Dharma door of non-duality, entering the Dharma gate of non-duality chapter, chapter nine, Akshayamati is the, the 20th Bodhisattva to explain how he entered the Dharma door of non-duality. So that's interesting. I may reference that in a moment. But Bodhisattva Akshayamati is more famous for appearing in chapter 25, chapter 25 of the Lotus Sutra. And chapter 25 is the famous um, chapter of Avilokiteshvara Bodhisattva, uh, Guan, Guan Yin Bodhisattva, that very famous Bodhisattva of compassion. Well, interestingly, her, his chapter, uh, Avilokiteshvara's chapter of the Lotus Sutra, the entire reason why it happens is because Bodhisattva Akshayamati asks, why is Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara called Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara? And oh, there, there comes the chapter. So that's that. Bodhisattva, Avi, uh, Bodhisattva Akshayamati also has his own sutra, which has not been translated into English. Uh, I'm doing my best at making my way through it. It's a, it's a serious sutra. I'm not going to kid you. It's in five pretty long parts. So look for that in like 2022, 20, 2023, something like that. So just know that this Bodhisattva has their own sutra, but tonight we find them as the star of the 45th jewel of the pile of jewels, the Ratnakuta, the Maha Ratnakuta Sutra collection. 
uh, which again, of course, is partially translated in this English translation, a collection, a treasury of Mahayana sutras. Uh, also, I apologize for the shirt, you know, it's blue day and I got a blue screen. So there's gonna be some, you know, virtual uh, stuff going on, but that's okay. Anyways, so that's our star of the show. This is a, a um, you know, seemingly a well-known bodhisattva within the world of Buddhism, but we in the English speaking world don't know much about him because his primary sutra has yet to be translated into English. And because this particular sutra that we're reading tonight is not the most famous sutra in the world, although it probably should be because it's so good. And that's, and that's why I want to share it with you tonight. Um, so that's where we're going um, into this Akshayamati. Um, there's not too much I have to say as a preliminary to the sutra. Uh, I've explained that this Bodhisattva's name means inexhaustible intellect. And let's just start there. Let's maybe, you know, just as like a entree, little appetizer, little Dharma appetizer, this idea of inexhaustibility, or as per last, uh, the last sutra, the inconceivable, the ineffable, uh, incalculable, you know, there's so many of these adjectives in, in Buddhism. But in particular, what I wanted to mention is, is that when you start hearing these adjectives like inexhaustible, indescribable, inconceivable, you can kind of rest assured that you're in the Mahayana. <laughs> They're kind of, these sorts of, call them superlatives if you would like, but these kind of, this way of speaking is very Mahayana. But in many ways, the entire uh, fall <laughs> semester of the Dharma doors, meaning the, the Manjushri's discourse on the Praniparamita, the eight weeks that we spent on that sutra. Part of what should make sense to you considering that is that this inexhaustible, this, this ineffable state of Buddhahood, Nirvana, all of these things, even from the beginning, from the earliest days of Buddhism, they were placed well outside of the conventional, well outside of the conditioned. From the beginning, we have, we, we, if you're interested in the Dharma, you're interested in Buddhism, then you're interested in that which is outside of the conditioned. From the beginning. What the Mahayana does is sort of make a poetic, beautiful, upayic language game of describing that which is unconditioned and all of that. So I just want you to know that even though the early Buddhist tradition doesn't use these adjectives and they're kind of an, a, 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 a hallmark of the Mahayana, we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about the same ideas, okay? And so, this inexhaustible intellect, right? That's this bodhisattva, this, this concept of, well, yeah, that, I, I can't get too into it. Otherwise, we would never start the sutra. So let's start the sutra. This is this very Mahayana bodhisattva uh, character. But before, let, yeah, before we even do that, let's find out. Let's find out where we are, uh, what's going on. Uh, so if you, if you have the collection, this is uh, Sutra 21 in this collection, but we know it's Sutra 45. So this is the Akshaya Mati Paripricha Sutra. Thus have I heard. Once the Buddha was dwelling near Rajgriha, on Mount Gridrakuta, the vulture's peak. 
together with an assembly of 1,250 monks. There were also 10,000 bodhisattva mahasattvas present, among whom were bodhisattva wisdom banner, bodhisattva dharma banner, bodhisattva moon banner, bodhisattva sun banner, bodhisattva boundless banner, 16 lay bodhisattvas with the bodhisattva Bhajrapala at their head, 60 bodhisattva mahasattvas of incomparable mind with Manjushri, crown prince of the Dharma, at the head, and all 16 of the bodhisattva mahasattvas of the Bhajrakalpa, the worthy kalpa, with Bodhisattva Maitreya foremost among them, and 60,000 other Bodhisattvas with Bodhisattva inexhaustible wisdom or inexhaustible intellect or inexhaustible mind foremost among them. And so I didn't draw all the Bodhisattvas, but I did my best to here draw the, the banners and in, in a sutra, a sutra, maybe even the Vimalakirti Sutra, I spoke a little bit about this idea of the, the banner. Um, like, a, this is, you know, and, I, and what I spoke about was that we in the modern age, we think it's all about cell phones and maybe telephones in terms of telecommunication, communicating at a distance. But a very, 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 very old form of telecommunication, communication at a distance, a very old form of that was communication by banners. Uh, the only remnant of it that we really have nowadays is semaphore. There is a language of flashing flags, banners, to communicate via long distances. That's tele. tele communication. And so there's this whole in all those bodhisattvas and all those banner bodhisattvas assembled bodhisattva inexhaustible wisdom or inexhaustible mind rose from his seat, uncovered his right shoulder, knelt upon his right knee, faced the Buddha with palms joined. In the mind, Bodhi is inapprehensible. <laughs> Apart from Bodhi, the mind is inapprehensible. Apart from the mind, Bodhi is inapprehensible. Bodhi or enlightenment is completely formless, totally without characteristics or signs or marks, and totally inexpressible. The mind is also totally formless, totally characteristicless, and unable to be indicated or demon demonstrated, demonstrable. Thus too, our sentient beings also signless, formless, indescribable. None of these three are apprehensible, describable, or have signs. World honored one, 
since all dharmas are like that, indescribable, formless, without signs, by what principle should we cultivate the mind of enlightenment? <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop there before we get into the Buddha's beautiful answer. Akshayamati, inexhaustible intellect, just posed a question to the Buddha. And put it to put it very, very, very simply, he asked, how do you get enlightened? <laughs> Period. That's what he asked. He's like, I've heard about people being enlightened. How do you get enlightened? I'd love to be enlightened. Uh, awake, woke, whatever. I would like, I want to know how, how that happens. <laughs> That's very, very simply what was just asked and what we're going to be talking about for who knows how many weeks. How to develop an enlightened mind. And before we get into the Buddha's wonderful answer of how to do that, I have a few things to say about the way in which this question was asked. So first of all, of course, Akshaya Amati, the name, the name, it kind of indicates it, right? Uh, Akshaya is this inexhaustible, endless, infinite. Uh, in fact, this, the, wherever it went, this translates it as infinite rather than inexhaustible. But there's a slight difference between infinite and inexhaustible. And the term is inexhaustible, like a fire that cannot that never ends is sort of the idea. Whereas infinite has either a sense of end, endless boundlessness in a way. So we're not kind of actually, the reason why I would not translate this as, as infinite is because we're not trying to actually go like this, right? Like, ooh, like to the, to, to infinity and beyond, right? We're not doing infinity and beyond. We're actually interested in this idea of, of inexhaustibility just keep going keep going forever forever and ever and ever and then mati so akshaya means inexhaustible and then mati is mati is interesting but it kind of indicates the mind or intellect this translates it as wisdom i would not translate it as wisdom i it's tricky because the it kind of means wisdom, but, you know, we, we have so few words in English. <laughs> and so we need to save wisdom for when they're talking about wisdom. And this is sort of more about a certain type of intellect. And so this inexhaustible intellect bodhisattva, you know, he's, um, he's a sharp cookie. And so he words his question in a very particular way, which basically, again, if you were here for the last eight weeks where we spoke about the inconceivable and how there's no such thing as sentient beings and all and no such thing as mind, if, if you were here, then that's where Aksham Shamati is at, which is this idea of like, if enlightenment let me get this straight buddha if enlightenment i'm going to i'm about to paraphrase this question so if enlightenment is not like conditioned thinking how do i think of it <laughs> it's it's actually kind of very interesting and simple in that way where he's a smart guy or a smart bodhisattva and is like i i get it so then how, how, how? <laughs> that's, that's his, how then? So, oh, I, oh, I gotta, I gotta say this before we go any further. I, I, I did a Dharma talk, or at least I did a Sutra talk in which I discussed this, this Chinese character. Fa, it's a, a what they call first tone, fa, to it's an such an interesting character. This is the verb that's being 
asked about. How do, and, and the reason why I have the Chinese character, many of you know already, the reason why I have the Chinese character is we do not have a Sanskrit version of this sutra. This was translated from Sanskrit into Chinese by, oh, by Bodoruchi. So Bodoruchi was ba way back in the day. So early part of this uh, world we live in, Bodoruchi translated this from Sanskrit. And now all we have is the, the Sanskrit version. And so all we know is this verb. This is the verb that is being discussed for the whole sutra. How do you fa, how do you initiate? This is the word fa means to generate, initiate. But what's really, really interesting about, and this is, um, oh, sorry, I'm starting to already get too excited. This is the verb for generating or developing the mind of enlightenment, the pu ti shin bodhicitta. So the Chinese call it pu ti shin bodhicitta. When the first Sanskrit speaking monks encountered the first Chinese speaking monks, the Sanskrit speaking monks were talking about bodhi, butti, butti. And the Chinese were saying, puti, puti, buddhi, buddhi, <laughs> puti, pu, and they're, yeah, puti, puti. What I mean to say is, is that puti is just the, the phonetic transliteration of bodhi. But the chitta, mind part, shin, the heart mind in Chinese, the chitta, mind state, this is what we're talking about. How do you develop, how, do you, how does one fa the mind of enlightenment or an enlightened mind? All of this is kind of interesting on a linguistic level in terms of, well, you know, do I, do I achieve enlightenment? Do I attain? enlightenment do you know it's like verbs are actually kind of important in terms of setting out on our way and what i mean by that is is that this word fa in chinese interestingly if you break it down uh, i don't know how um picked it pictographically i guess it's not quite etymologically but if you break it down pictographically what this word means is if you were to start, um, there's a hand in there, there's a, it's a lot of stuff in this Chinese character, but it's, is if you were to start uh, creating a path, like through the woods, and you were to start like with a machete, start hacking away to create a path, this word is, is when you start doing that. So it is initiate, generate, but if I were to say generate, you might not think of hacking your own path to enlightenment, <laughs> right? So I want you to know that the verb that we're dealing with here is doing that, blazing a trail to enlightenment. And the question is, is how do you blaze a trail to enlightenment? How do you initiate? How do you start off? on the path to enlightenment? That's the, that's the question. And the reason, well, no, uh, I'll get to why I said all that in a second. Let's, let's get into the Buddha's beautiful answer. Yeah, Buddha's, Buddha's beautiful answer. Um, I am, as usual, working on my own translation, but for now, I'm gonna rely on this one because mine's very rough at the moment. So the Buddha said, after Bodhisattva Akshayamati poses this interestingly worded question, the Buddha says, good son, listen closely and I'll explain. The buddhi, enlightenment, the enlightenment, the buddhi, 
I speak of intrinsically has no name and no description. Why? Because within enlightenment, names and descriptions are inapprehensible. The same is true of the mind and sentient beings. Having such an understanding is called the mind of enlightenment or bodhicitta. Bhutti, enlightenment, has nothing to do with the past, has nothing to do with the present, nothing to do with the future. The mind and sentient beings also have nothing to do with the past, nothing to do with the present, nothing to do with the future. One who understands this is called a bodhisattva. Nonetheless, within bodhisattvahood too, there is nothing that is apprehensible. One who realizes that all phenomena, all dharmas, all truths, all principles, one who realizes that all dharmas are inapprehensible is said to have attained bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment. An arahat, a worthy one who has attained arhatship, has actually attained nothing. It is only to follow the convention of language that he is said to have attained our hotship. All dharmas, all phenomena, all concepts, all principles, all truths are inapprehensible. And bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment, is no exception to that. To guide novice bodhisattvas, bodhicitta is spoken of. But there is neither a citta, a mind, nor the term mind in any of this. There is neither buddhi nor the term buddhi in any of this. Neither sentient beings nor the term sentient beings. Neither voice hearers, shravakas, nor the term shravaka neither solitary enlightened ones, pratekya buddhas, nor the term pratekya buddha, neither bodhisattvas, nor the term bodhisattvas, neither tathagatas, thus come ones, nor the term tathagatas, neither the conditioned, nor the term the conditioned, neither the unconditioned, nor the term unconditioned, neither attainment in the present nor some future attainment. Nevertheless, I will use words to explain. <laughs> That's why I love sutras. They're so funny. They're like intellectual, intellectual humor in that way. They're, it's so wonderful to me for that. So I hope everybody just appreciated what happened. Again, you know, I kind of prefaced this at the beginning, but the enlightenment that the Buddha has always been talking about is unconditioned, right? But even that term is a term. And so that's not what we're talking about, right? Words have nothing to do with this. Language, term, all of that has nothing to do with this. Nevertheless, I'll use some words, <laughs> the Buddha says, in order to explain, right? Um, before I get into this next part, which is actually the, 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 the meat of the matter, 
Any questions or ideas or comments so far as we start off on this new sutra? Everybody good? Kind of com comfortable, everybody comfortable with what's going on? Cool. Okay. Um, so again, it's a pretty simple question in that way of what's enlightenment? What is bodhicitta? Um, and how does it come about? But not just like, you know, where do I go to get me some of that bodhicitta, right? Because again, we're already kind of on the path and understanding of things. And so we're kind of like, wow, this Dharma is pretty deep. So how would you even begin to approach this, right? So nevertheless, I'll use words to explain. And this is actually where this translation starts to break down. So I'll read you the first part, but then I, I'll think I, I'll switch to my translation because there's a really beautiful thing that's going on. And I know why they did what they did, but it's one of those things that's unfortunate because, you know, it's unfortunate. So here we go. The Buddha says, nevertheless, I'm going to use language to explain. And he says, um, I'm, and this is where the, the translators have, have like, they've added a bunch of stuff that's not really there, but I know why they did it. So he says, nevertheless, I will use words to explain the 10 ways to generate bodhicitta. And that's, that's correct in terms of what's happening. That, he doesn't say that, but that's, that's what's happening. And then the Buddha says, first, first is the vow to be foremost in the cultivation of extensive good roots. Just like Mount Meru towers above everything else. So uh, I'm, this is one of those things that I, I'm hesitant to even get it too into the linguistics here, but it, I also figure why not? <laughs> like why why not right um so here's the thing this, this these translators have inserted this idea of um oh, so by the way if you if you haven't seen and i actually noticed that my background cut off the numbers you're not missing any information you're just missing the numbers one two three four five you see the six seven eight nine ten the buddha is about to give a beautiful description of the 10 paramitas, the perfections or excellences of a bodhisattva. This is what we're going to spend the next many, many weeks talking about, the 10 paramitas. It's a great idea. It, it constitutes the bodhisattva path. And I'm looking forward to talking all about <laughs> these 10 paramitas, but I need to, to tell you this. <laughs> this text translates this as the first vow. And that's where they go wrong. And, and I mean, I'm not the, uh, the world's most expert in Chinese, but I, I translate a lot of sutras and I, I, I kind of have a sense, especially for Bodhiruchi, Kumarajiva, a few translators, I have a sense of how they use language. And this, the way that the, the, this section of the sutra reads, like at least in the Chinese, is that it says, I will now rely on words to explain. And it's about this idea that if of all sentient beings, there is someone whose virtuous roots, and this is like a, a deep concept in Buddhism, the development of wholesome or virtuous roots. This is like a right effort is the development of wholesome roots. And so this is like a big idea. And so the Buddha says that if of all sentient beings, if there is someone whose virtuous roots are 
are so per pervasive, broad and great, surpassing all other beings and their, their virtuous roots are like Mount Meru rising above all others. This is the first fa, <laughs> the first initiation of enlightenment. And what I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is that this isn't about vows. And the reason why I, as a Buddhologist or whatever, as a Dharma teacher, the reason why I'm like, this is serious is there are serious bodhisattva vows that are taken. And there's also um, a schema of 10 particular vows that are taken by the bodhisattva. And these are not the vows. These are the paramitas. And what this sutra is about is the the generation again the fa the initiation of enlightenment it's not about making a vow just yet it's actually about generating enlightenment so it's a really unfortunate that first of all this texts translate these as 10 vows it's it's uh, although it sounds kind of paradoxical in English, I don't actually think the paradox is unintentional. But the, the, the way this should sort of really read is the initial initiation. And then we're going to get to the secondary initiation, the, the tertiary initiation. It's like it's all the same initiation, generation, or bringing forthness that's being spoken about. This fa, and there's going to be 10 uh, steps to that bringing about. So I just wanted to make that clear, that there's no vows. If it, Again, if you're, if you're reading this one, this is about how do I, how do I like, how do I turn this baby on? How do I initiate the mind of enlightenment? Okay. So that's the first thing I need to say. And then the second thing I need to say, which is really, you know, it's one of those things. The, the way that I understand the, these, the way this section of the sutra reads, where the Buddha, Buddha outlines the 10 paramitas, they are all given, first of all, as analogies. And this is very, very interesting if you study Buddhism, in particular, if you study Mahayana Buddhism, and you get, you get very, um, if you study Mahayana Buddhism, you become aware of how aware the Buddha and the sutras are of how aware they are of the um, mimetic quality of language, which is every, it's like this. And there's a way in which, of course, if we were to all be really real, if we were to all speak really, really appropriately, we should put like before everything in a way <laughs> in a way it's it's like i'm it's like i'm teaching a class it's like i'm a human it's like a human you know it's like everything should be equated with it it's it's like that and mahayana sutras are very aware of that and the buddha in Mahayana Sutras is very aware of that and so he just gave this the whole thing about how language is useless <laughs> language is totally useless in trying to speak of that which should is beyond language. Nonetheless, I'm going to use some similes and parables and metaphors to describe is ultimately what just happened. So the reason why I say that is, is you in this translation, 
you would kind of miss that subtle aspect that all of these are analogs, analogous in that way. And you would also miss, if you read this one, that all of these are an, an, uh, analogs, they're analogous for this person, whoever you are, this person of all people who has developed such good roots, good roots that tower above like Mount Maru, good roots that are like the great earth, able to stabilize all things. That, that by the way, is the second initiation of enlightenment by way of the paramita of moral discipline or shila. So what I mean to say is, is that the way that I read this sutra, the Buddha has said language is useless, but I'm going to use it nonetheless. And it's like this. If somebody's virtuous roots are like, and he gives 10 analogies, they, they missed that. And they, they missed it, actually. It's an unfortunate. It's an unfortunate. It's a, um, I don't know. It's one of those things, um, but you've got me and I'm translating this from English. So if all of all sentient beings, if there is someone whose virtuous roots are broad and great, surpassing all beings, like Mount Sumeru rising above, above all others, that is the first initiation of enlightenment by way of the paramita of giving, dana, that is the premier excellence, the premier practice is giving, giving donations, giving attention, giving kind speech, giving love, giving compassion, giving of yourself to the practice of compassion, giving upon giving upon giving. That is the initial practice of the bodhisattva. If someone's virtuous roots are like the great earth, able to stabilize all things, that is the second initiation of enlightenment by way of the paramita of shila, moral discipline. If someone's great virtuous roots of merit are so broad and so resolved and intent, boldly progressing and peacefully receiving all afflictions, like the awesomeness of a lion king, master of all beasts, their body without fear. This is the third initiation of enlightenment by way of the paramita of patience, kashanti. If of all sentient beings, there is someone whose virtuous roots are broad and great, surpassing all being, beings, whose virtuous roots are powerful and swift, able to sub able to subdue all afflictions, which have just been previously well received, right? Able to subdue all afflictions, like Vishnu or Narayana, who defeats all opponents. This is the fourth initiation of enlightenment by way of the paramita of virya, determination. If there is someone whose virtuous roots, who has meritoriously virtuous roots of all types, bursting forth like the heavenly flowers of the Parijata and Kovidara trees in bloom, this is the fifth initiation of enlightenment by way of the paramita of meditation or dhyana. 
if there is someone whose virtuous roots are cleared of ignorance and darkness, like the boundless radiance of the sun, this is the sixth initiation of enlightenment by way of the paramita of pranya, wisdom, tra transcendent wisdom. If there is someone with virtuous roots who is meritoriously satisfied and joyful of mind, having accomplished each and every adornment of mind, who, like a great merchant, uses their abundance skillfully to uplift those in danger and in hardship. This is the seventh initiation of enlightenment by way of the paramita of expedient means, upaya. If there is someone with virtuous roots, obstructions removed, the mind fully satisfied and joyful, like a clear full moon. This is the eighth initiation of enlightenment by way of the paramita of bala, power. And if there is someone whose virtuous roots are broad and great and who has who with, this is where it gets a little tricky, but who like within their world, Buddha lands and sentient beings all fully adorned in purity with virtuous dharmas, all having been achieved like a poor person who attains an inexhaustible treasury and can fulfill all their wishes. This is the ninth initiation of enlightenment by way of the paramita of de, uh, this is a tricky one devotion. I'm going to go with devotion by way of the paramita of pranidana. We're going to talk about all these pranidana, devotion. And one whose Virtuous roots are fortunate and wise, boundless like empty space, who is a sovereign of the Dharma, like a will-turning sage king, having been anointed. This is the tenth initiation of enlightenment by way of the paramita of jnana, knowledge. Virtuous one, one who succeeds in observing these 10 kinds of initiations of enlightenment is called a bodhisattva, is called a supreme being, a being without obstruction, not an inferior being. Yet since in reality, nothing is attainable. There is no sentient being, no mind, no enlightenment, no bodhisattva. <laughs> okay. So that's that's all we're going to talk about tonight. Um, see if I can get a something. There you are. Okay. So tonight we're going to talk about the 10 paramitas. But in particular, this is not, this is not necessarily a sutra on the 10 paramitas. This is a sutra on generating the mind of enlightenment and the 10 steps, the 10 initiations, the 10 generations. This is where I think English fails us where you know for me the only the only image that came to mind was when you're trying to start your car up and it's like and then that tenth one it's like all right now we're going but it takes 10 initiations <laughs> right i don't know if you have that kind of car but that was the only thing that came to mind 
in terms of English of how there could be this sort of like 10 step beginning because that is indeed exactly what this sutra is about, is about beginning bodhisattva-ness-hood, <laughs> right? It's about that idea of, of generating this, um, well, bodhicitta. And bodhicitta is something that, you know, that's sort of, I, I think that's something that's spoken a lot about, you know, in the in the Buddhist world is is bodhicitta, the sort of enlightened mind or the mind of enlightenment. And again, this question of akshayam, akshayamati is is it's important to us, which is how do we do that? How do we how do we move from unenlightenment to enlightenment? I mean, that's ultimately also kind of the question. And the Buddha's answer is, it's like <laughs> these 10 things. And the way that, of course, the way that I tried to draw this tonight on my, my, my board is that these are the roots. These are those virtuous roots that then culminate in this enlightenment, right? And so that's a kind of a beautiful extension of that old, very old school Buddhist idea. I already mentioned it about right effort, which is cultivating wholesome roots, you know? And if you haven't heard this before, always good reminder. Um, the, the Buddhist metaphor here is viewing the mind as a field, right? Where seeds are planted various kinds of seeds and those seeds well first of all those seeds might lay dormant for a while but they eventually might root and sprout and you might have a a little seed of anger right somebody said something wrong to you and planted a little seed of anger and as soon as that little sprout of anger arises in your mind this is where the right effort comes in. Are you going to water that root? Are you going to tend to that root and let that anger grow into a little sprout and into a little, little bush? Or are you going to come along and not give that little sprout any attention so that that sprout of anger goes away? And are you then going to walk around the garden of your mind and say, oh, look, a little sprout of kindness. I'll sprinkle some water on that and try to cultivate that aspect of myself. So I'm going to try to cultivate those better aspects of myself and not give a lot of attention and mind energy water to those bad aspects, the unwholesome aspects. And the old school, the old school Buddhist idea is that if you did this well enough, you could eventually purify the mind entirely of unwholesome dharmas, unwholesome roots in that way. This is a Mahayana Sutra. So we're going to obviously be um, aware of our dualisms. We're going to be aware of that kind of dualistic mind that deals in purity and impurity. So don't, don't worry. But we are still going to be dealing with that, that gardener, the gardener metaphor of cultivating these 10 roots. And of course, the idea here is, is that, well, you know, if we go back to the fa, that initiate or generate, you can think of your, your sprouts, your microgreens. If you grow microgreens or sprouts and that the initiation, the little initiation that eventually becomes the, the thing you're gonna eat, that initiation is what we're talking about, the sprouting. And so there's a lot of uh, hortic horticultural metaphors going on tonight in that regard. Um, yeah, and so that's the idea. This is um, a pretty short sutra. Um, so I don't know how long it's going to take us. That's just the beginning. This is just the beginning, by the way. So 
I want to walk us through these 10 because these are the, this is what are, it's about. The 10, it's a, uh, the reason why I chose this sutra is it's a great sutra for introducing all 10 paramitas. You, you might have been aware of just the six paramitas, right? <laughs> Culminating with wisdom, but this is sort of all 10 of them. So we're going to talk about all 10. Um, time for a pause. Questions, answers, ideas about anything that's been said so far? Then on that note, I'm just going to start going through the 10 paramitas to sort of um, do my best to explain the Buddha's analogies. Uh, because these 10 are, um, I, I mean, basically, I could spend all night just on the paramita of giving. So to even try to do all 10 in one night is a little ambitious, but ambitious is my middle name. So. Um, if there's no questions, we're going to dive right into that. Try to find my, my first page. So I already tried to give you a, a good explanation of the paramita of dana or giving. And that's where I said, yeah, it's giving like donations, but it's also giving time. It's giving attention. It's giving kind speech. It's giving love. It's giving compassion. And ultimately, it's just a disposition of giving. And, and, and what, what I'm giving or even that, I, it's like, no, it's about a disposition, a heart space of giving. That is this first paramita. And it is considered yeah, the foremost paramita. In many ways, and sometimes it's just considered the only paramita. The rest are sort of like, you know, it's like really all about this paramita. And uh, because this is class one, let me digress for a minute on this word paramita. Um, so the word para means uh, over, para. Uh, and the idea of a paramita is this idea of like crossing over, but in particular, what a paramita is, well, the crossing over that's being referenced is a movement from the suffering world of samsara to the enlightened world of nirvana and sort of a crossing over from samsara to nirvana. And so paramitas are uh, fairies and not uh, F-E-R-R-Y, F-E-R-R-Y. They're like boats that carry one over to the shores of nirvana. So these are the, you know, and that should make sense within the context of tonight's sutra. These are the 10 things that bring us to nirvana or bring us to bodhicitta or enlightenment in that case. And the first thing that brings us to enlightenment or bodhicitta is this disposition of giving. And, you know, yeah, this is the bodhisattva path. This is the bodhisattva practice, the dana paramita, the practice of giving. And I've spoken about this in the past, but it, you know, it's always good to repeat it. In the original old school version of Buddhism, the, there was dana, there was giving, but it was the lay, lay Buddhists who performed dana and gave to the monks so that they could go to nirvana. And the giving, the dana, was so that the lay people could get a better rebirth and maybe be a monk or a nun in their next life. That was the old school version of give. Like, why should you give? Well, because it gets you a better rebirth, makes you popular. And I'm not joking. It, it, it like makes you 
um, friendly, like, and so you have friends in popularity if you give things. And so you get reborn in a better world if you give things. But if you want to get to nirvana, you know, that's meditation. That's, that's the old school, the old school version. What I'm getting at is that when the bodhisattva path becomes a thing and Mahayana Buddhism comes on the scene, they're like, oh, no, 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 no. It's all about giving. Lay, monastic, God, hell, it doesn't matter. It's all about giving. But here's where the, the, the bodhisattva path, the bodhicitta, the bodhisattva path becomes interesting is that they realized, oh yeah, oh yeah. He told us about non-attachment. <laughs> he, he, he taught us about clinging and attachment. <laughs> that was the Dharma, that suffering is caused by attachment. <laughs> and so the disposition, the disposition of giving is the practice. <laughs> Period. Good night. Good luck. <laughs> right? And so what I'm saying is, is that this, the Mahayana emphasis on giving is not just because they're, they're good people. <laughs> it's not just because they're like really kind, generous, altruistic people. It's actually wisdom that realizes, oh, yeah, the disposition of giving is it. That's it. But if you need a little, if you need a little more reinforcement, you need a little more help along the line, we can talk about moral discipline. We can talk about Sheila. Okay. So traditionally, moral discipline, I gotta keep track of the time, moral discipline or Sheila referred to following the rules. <laughs> the Buddha said. Don't, don't do, avoid doing this, avoid doing that, avoid killing, avoid stealing, uh, avoid sensual or sexual misconduct, avoid these things. And if you do those things, that's Sheila. Following the rules was the old school, original Buddhist understanding of Sheila, follow the rules. The bodhisattva path as a paramita, moral discipline is about, well, it's about being morally disciplined. It is about not killing. It is about not stealing. It is about not speaking falsely. It, it is about those things, but it's not about them in a follow the rules kind of a way, nor is it a kind of, um, well, from an old school Buddhist point of view, it would be about following the rules in order to become pure. That actually was the more old school original prescription was the reason why you should not kill take what is not given, speak falsely, sensual misconduct, or take intoxicants, the, the, the big five. The reason why you should avoid the big five is because it, it contaminates you. It defiles you, makes you impure. And you'll never actually... Um, again, I'm still speaking from an old school Buddhist point of view, you will never, um, met <clears throat> metaphysically, you cannot get into dhyana if you have committed falsehood or uh, shed blood, killed something. There's kind of this metaphysical understanding that you, you, your mind's messed up I'm and you won't actually get to a peaceful state of mind because you're... Um, E either because you're caught in your web of lies 
or because you have the guilt of the, the, the killing on you or the guilt of the stealing, you, you can't get into a good dhyana. You're impure. And so you should practice moral discipline in order to get pure, in order to get into a dhyana and samadhi in order to purify your mind. That was the old school Buddhist version of moral discipline. I'm not entirely saying that that's not like uh, true. <laughs> and that, I, I do think uh, speaking falsely messes with your mind. <laughs> I, I do, uh, you know, these things I think are true, but the, the Bodhisattva Mahayana version of Shila moral discipline, it's very interesting. They say, the Bodhisattva path says, you, you, you are morally disciplined, say, against uh, uh, stealing for that other person that you're not taking from, for that animal or that other person that you're not injuring. It's for them not for your moral purity, but for a better world. And so it's for actually the Bodhisattva says, oh yeah, I should be morally disciplined. I should watch what I say because it's actually totally messed up to lie to people. It's totally messed up to do that to people. It, it, in the same way that it's messed up to take their stuff without their consent, Definitely in the same way that it's messed up to harm them. So the, again, the idea from a Bodhisattva point of view is that it's the reason why one should be morally disciplined is for the other. Not, not for this. And actually, if I want to present or represent the Bodhisattva path appropriately, it's because within the paramita of giving, I've given up myself. I've given up my ego. I've given, I've give, I gave that up. And I didn't give it up out of um, self-deprecation. I didn't give it up out of whatever. I gave it up because it doesn't exist. That's the Dharma. No self. It's an enlightened move to give up attachment to the self. <laughs> Then you can more move on to moral discipline, but not to morally discipline yourself. What self? We're past that already, bodhisattvas. So the moral discipline, again, is in regards to the other. Questions about number one or two? And My I have a short question. I'm thinking about the term in, impure. Could I maybe understand um, being impure in that context being that I reinforce conditioning, like when I lied and, you know, also on a neurological level, it does something with my brain. I mean, it's not made up, it, it does something. So you are you know, the um, neurons that wire to uh, together fire together, you know, that kind of sense. So um, could I understand I'm pure of, yeah, of deluding my mind? Is that? Absolutely, okay. Connie. In fact, that's what I'm kind of trying to say is that I'm not a big fan of the language of purity. In fact, the whole Mahayana Bodhisattva path is not a fan of the language of purity. <laughs> um, they, they might use it, but the Bodhisattva Mahayana uh, tradition is very critical of the old school Buddhist uh, tradition that thought about things as pure and impure. And so, Connie, ex your, as usual, Connie, your way of thinking is the Bodhisattva Mahayana way. Okay. So for, just forget about purity, frankly. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, ampi and pure is is um, used so much in 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 Dharma teachings. And uh, yeah. Yeah, you think about Christianity, you know, they also talk about you know being pure and impure, not only on the physical level but also in a, on a mental level. So if we you know understand purity in 
differently if we understand it in regards of conditioning then then it makes sense i mean unpure and pure is just also only our idea about something right it's it's just our concept so yeah okay thank you beautiful connie such wisdom thank you so everybody good on the first two cool mike okay. yeah no um <laughs> This is a little out of left field, but um, being as how it it is uh, November first, and we have an election coming in two days, it it struck me something you were saying about the difference between how one looked at Chila under the old school and the Mahayana traditions as being sort of similar to some descriptions I've seen of where certain places in the political spectrum are with regard to sort of a having a, a an authority figure that tells you what to do is like a good thing versus you know doing the right mm. thing because mm. it's what's best for everyone which is not the, the exactly the distinction you were making but but they they seem related to me especially in the current political atmosphere that there's a sort of authoritarian person telling people what to do but they're also telling them you know this is best for you not this is best for the the greater good there seems to be sort of a mm. schism there that kind of reminds me a little of what you were talking about oh yeah great point gnome and i'm totally gonna like dodge that i'm just gonna like whoop <laughs> by by not addressing it but i will um I totally address it though I Thank will you. totally address your question, uh, basically by throwing somebody else under the bus. Um, <laughs> and what I, which is a safer, it's safer. Um, but this, the, I'm, I'm often, uh, many of, as many of you know, I'm often pointing out this Mahayana critique of early Buddhism, that the, whether it's the hierarchy or whether it's the pure, uh, Puritanism, where uh, the the early tradition seems to have gotten very obsessed with purity, but like obsessed with purity, again to the point where women were impure to a certain degree and therefore needed to be kind of kept away, and so that that mind of purity, and even the mind, and actually let me step away from that to bring it closer to where I was going with the, answering your question. The tradition of, uh, wow, yeah, that a lot of things come to mind just then. The tradition of looking out for number one, the tradition of looking out for one's self is as old as it gets. And the wisdom that it is, or I should say that the realization that it is wise to not just look out for number one <laughs> is also as old as it gets. And my point about that is, is that the way that this Mahayana tradition looks at the early Buddhist tradition and is basically kind of like, wow, well, well, okay, well, that's good for you, but what about the rest of us? where it is a method of becoming uh, less suffering and maybe enlightened or whatever you want to call it, but it's very localized in the individual. And in a way, as I often say, you know, that early Buddhist tradition was interested in carving out a safe place in the world or carving out a safe place from the world that they thought was utterly crazy. They wanted to carve out a safe little vihara, a, a safe little place for us to meditate and work on our mind. And what was going on out there? That's, that's Maraville. That's Mara land. That's Mara's, like, forget about it. Come over here. And I, as I often say, the Mahayana tradition is this sort of like grand project of turning the world into a safe place to meditate, but 
more than the grand project of turning the world into a safe place to meditate, it's a deeper wisdom realization of, oh, nobody gets enlightened until we're all enlightened. And that's really, really, really true. Like in a really, really deep, 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 deep way. And so, Noam, to kind of come back to your, your, your comment, this thing about like self-help, call it that, like self-help programs and like any kind of modern, um, whether it be political or religious, but any kind of political or religious ideology that is really encouraging you just to worry about yourself and yourself alone in that way, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But the Mahayana version, which again, it's out of wisdom. And what I, what I mean by that when I say this is out of wisdom, if, if I want to even dare to tread to where Noam was uh, uh, going as far as like modern politics and election politics and all of that, again, I'm not even, I'm not even going to go near it. But if one wants to talk about like, or if I want to explain what I mean by that, that it's wise to do this, it's, it's this realization that it's like, if I'm in my house meditating and I'm like, what, you know, what do they say? Like zen out, right? Okay, I'm all zen out, mm, right? And now I go walking around my neighborhood and my neighborhood's totally crazy, but I'm zen out. And so they're crazy, but I'm like, whatever, because I'm Zen master. Sure, that, that's one method. The other method is going door to door and making friends with your neighbors and creating a kind of safe environment. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, it's two very kind of different approaches. And I don't want to dismiss the first one. Because I would love, and, and in fact, from a Kantian point of view, if everybody was in their house getting zenned out, it would be a wonderful world. <laughs> so if, the, if everybody applied that maxim of being zenned out as their, that was their, their ethical maxim, then yeah, it would be a great world. But it would also be a great world too if everybody was interested in making their community whole in that in that way and so no I'm, I, I went off on a few different like directions but i hope i kind of said something interesting <laughs> or not <laughs> hey michael yeah eric uh, yeah i have an interesting comment now that you're talking uh in in this way of uh, I want to touch on the lore, if you will, of the uh, of the disciples and the Shravakas, and the, because you have made connections to Vimalakirti, also I want to like connect some linear narratives that I find common, and because you were talking about self improvement and the way to reach nirvana as a way of self-realization. And you put it in a Kantian way of what if everybody will do that at home, right? And if, if we want to go to the narratives that, that these sutras talk about, like about other universes and those Buddha verses and some of them, like everybody is enlightened, right? In some of them. And in, in some Buddha verses. And it, it apparently it, it is to me so in the chapter number 10 of Vimalakirti, when we go to this uh, Buddha verse called the Sarva Ganda Suganda with the Tathagata Sugandakuta. And apparently all his disciples are from the Hinayana vehicle. And in this Saha world where we live, we have the greater vehicle. We can become Buddhas and bodhis 
oh, we can become bodhisattvas and we can travel through the Mahayana path. So, yeah, so hmm. it's nice to be in this world. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, indeed it, it, it is it is and it and it's like i said i don't ever 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 want to dismiss or uh put down the original buddhist uh program as i call it because i do think that we all need it i do think that it's wisdom for all of us it's just that i think that that program is from 500 BC, 400 BC, maybe 300 BC. Whereas this Mahayana tradition, and it's almost at the point, you know, where, oh my gosh, you know, it's like, I mean, I, there's analogies that come to mind as far as like, you know, uh, somebody bringing up the Federalist Papers you know, and like bringing up some like really old American history and trying to apply it today. There's a way in which Mahayana Buddhism is Buddhism. Like it's, it's really like such a part of it. But uh, my, my point was, is that I never want to put down that original program, but I do, you know, think that there's so much uh, Buddhist wisdom in these Mahayana sutras for uh, community building, for a lot of uh, things that are, are, are part of this 21st century world, like really, <clears throat> really, really important work that people are trying to do. Again, community building, peacemaking, all of these things, but in a really, really um, complex, interconnected uh, world. And so I kind of want everybody to know, you know, the Buddha, Buddhism has a really like these really great teachings for this stuff, for, for community building. And it's hard to find community building um, resources in the early Buddhist tradition, because unless you were a monk or a nun, you weren't really in the community. And so community building for the early Buddhist tradition was celibacy. That'll do it. That, and it will kind of sort of do it. But my, my point is, is that the original community building was about celibacy. And in the Mahayana tradition, we have the four means of unification, right? Kind speech, cooperation, volunteerism, and, and donations. It's like these really interesting ideas. So again, I digress. <laughs> Thanks, Eric, for bringing us to the wonderful world of all beautiful smells. <laughs> okay, everybody good? Any more questions, ideas, comments? Um, then on, on that note, I'll just do one more paramita. You know, we only have a few minutes left and so I'll save talking about the rest of these especially the seven, eight, nine, and 10, the ones that we may not be more acquainted with, they definitely need a lot of time. But just to wrap things up, I'll talk about uh, patience, kushanti. This is a beautiful, um, it's a beautiful paramita. It's a beautiful uh, raft that delivers one to nirvana. It's a beautiful part of the bodhisattva practice. It's this word, kashanti. The etymological root of that word, of course, is shanti, which means peace. Om shanti, shanti, shanti. So shanti is this peace, but kashanti is this word. I like translating kashanti as patience because the English word patience, the etymological root of that is paz, our, our Latin peace, patience, it's kind of patience, right? And so I think patience and kashanti are, are they, they fit very, very nice together. 
But you should know that Kashanti is also sometimes translated as forbearance, endurance even, the idea of enduring. And there's not, there's not not that meaning <laughs> in Kashanti, that Kashanti does um, imply in, endurance. And it, indeed, the, the premier, the premier example of the Paramita of Kashanti, the, pr the best example of patience, and, it, and really the best example because it gives you the, the deeper dharmic importance. The, the best example of patience is when the Buddha in a previous life was a forest dwelling uh, ascetic. And one day for reasons I won't get into because it's a, a little story, a, a jealous, uh, angry king the king of Kali, Kalinga, the king of Kalinga came at the Buddha with anger and basically with a sword started to cut this uh, forest dwelling ascetic limb by limb, hand, arm, limb by limb. But at no point did the Buddha in this previous life, at no point did the Buddha give rise to animosity or anger towards his assailant. That is the definition of patience. And so what I'm going to do again, really quickly, is yes, Kshanti is a part of early Buddhism. And in early Buddhism, Kshanti was sort of like maybe something closer to contentment. This idea of just being cool with things as they are. Everything's Kishanti, right? Kind of an idea. But again, the idea of early Buddhism was that Kishanti was about me. And, and my mind, oh, my mind's all, my mind's all messed up. And now I'm, I'm Kashanti and now I'm peace. Versus the story that I just told you, which was about the Buddha in a previous life being assaulted, being eviscerated limb by limb, but never having animosity towards that person. This paramita, is about enduring other people's, you name it, enduring other people's stupidity, enduring other people's animosity, enduring other people's intolerance, enduring, it's about that and staying peaceful. I suppose if I wanted to be kind of cheeky, I would say, that what this paramita is about is about not being triggered, not having things that provoke you into anger, into whatever, but actually being more even keeled and more uh, chill, if I may. And what and the idea here is again is it's not about that ability to sit patiently. It's about that ideally idea of being assaulted, but not giving rise to anger. Kashanti is turning the other cheek. If I may employ that Christian saying of Jesus, this idea that when so, if somebody assaults you, what do you do? I don't know if it's offer them the other cheek. That might that's a Christian thing, I guess. But the, the idea of not getting angry at the person, that's Kishanti. And so maybe that's where the Buddhists and the Christians can agree that it is not wise to meet anger with anger. And in fact, I can tell you from plenty of personal experience that it never goes well.
it just feed it just feeds. So that's my little uh, pearl of wisdom for the for the evening. There, um, that's time. We made it through three of the paramitas, and so we'll pick up there next time. I have no agenda when it comes to this sutra. It'll take as long as it needs to take. And so uh, on that note, I want to thank everybody.